ready. Yeah, we're ready. Yeah. Perfect. Um, let me just go to share the screen. Um, let me make sure I have that capability. Yeah, oh, wow, big uh, class time. Yeah, yeah. Holy we cow. A total of 33 people involved and about 22 who show up most times. So, yeah, it's quite wow. a rewarding group to teach, eh? <laughs> Yay, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never thought I'd say that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I think you can see my screen now. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Let's get to this. Um, you're recording as you need to. Um, I, I am. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So we're going to get to introductions in the course outline and the lecture outline in a sec. But first, let's start off with a thought experiment. So I want you to do some imaginary time travel here and imagine it is the year 2050. You are a kid named Billy. If you have a day off school, so you do what any other kid would do in the year 2050. You head down before breakfast, you grab your VR headset, you pop it on, you decide to play a video game, you decide to kill some bad guys in VR, in the immersive world, virtual reality. And um, all before breakfast, you manage to win the game and kill all of these invaders. Except what you have done in reality is targeted uh, therapy against cancer in a patient's brain. And you did this as a kid all before breakfast on your day off from school. And my little clever twist to this game is calling it the Tumorinator. So everyone, welcome to the 2021 edition of Engineering Tomorrow, Fostering a Culture of Disruption and Innovation. My name is Dr. Shauna Pandya. Uh, I have been lucky enough to be part of this course for the better part of a decade now. Um, Dr. Solis has had me um, since I was a wee little medical student uh, in 2011. So it has been my pleasure to be part of this course and constantly update and, uh, and change um, how we look at innovation, how we teach it and bringing you as the students and course participants into innovation um, over the better part of the decade. So um, happy 10 year anniversary of this course, Kim. Uh, thanks for making nice. me part of this, this yeah. journey. Um, okay, so what do I hope you will walk away with once we are done with today's course? The objective, um, the what, the why, and the how. So I want you to develop a sense of, um, this will be all focused on innovation, and the what is to develop a sense of emerging trends and technologies that will impact the future of innovation, particularly as it relates to medicine. The why is to give you uh, a sense of why it's time to act. Um, and honestly, the fact that we're teaching this in front of our computers uh, rather than enjoying an in-person class, I think is why enough. Um, and then how, how do we get there? How do we, with our various disciplines, backgrounds, stages in our careers, um, breathe that innovation mindset? So to sum it all up, the three questions I hope to answer by the end of this lecture, what is innovation? Why does it matter? And how do we get there? How does one innovate? So there's gonna be a lot of thought experiments this class. So here's my second thought experiment. This is a very interactive class. I hope you've been warned. Um, feel free to just unmute yourselves and shout out the answers. So easy question, not a trick question at all. What is this? It's all What is it? It's like a soft drink bottle. The soft drink bottle, very, very, yes, that's exactly it. Okay, so here's where it becomes a little bit harder. What are the possible uses of a soft drink bottle? Store air, fluids, many kinds. For sure, as a storage container. You can recycle it and make clothing. Making clothing, yeah, recycled materials. Okay, keep going. CSI, according to CSI, you can make it into a one-time silencer for a gun. Cool, I didn't know that. I thought you were gonna say like a cool screenshot or a cool view from the pop bottle's point of view. Um, very CSI. Uh, what else? Um, you can make a plant pot out of it. <laughs> yes. Plant a pot, yeah. On the top, it makes a great funnel. <laughs> great funnel, exactly. Okay, I like where you're going with this. Feel free to keep on putting your answers into the chat. Um, some of you, uh, are reading my mind or the slides. Um, so 
here are all sorts of ways in which pop bottles have been repurposed as planters, as chandeliers, oh, that's not working, as bird feeders, as a jewelry collection holder, a pencil case, chandelier art installation, and as a piggy bank. So those are just some ways in which a pop bottle can be more than a pop bottle. And um, so here's another question. How can we make a pop bottle better? In what way? Well, in what way do you, is, does it not meet your satisfaction as a user? I, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I've already spoken, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, I, I was thinking maybe we can stop making it uh, with plastic and make better it better material. Plastic. Yeah, so more more environmentally friendly. Perfect. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. Well, that's you know you're on the right track. So there's lots of ways to make a bottle better. And when I first started this course, I ha I would often talk about the ketchup bottle problem, and that essentially is what kind of this is part of any container. This is part of a shampoo bottle, it's part of a pop can. Most containers don't let us use the entirety of the volume of what they contain. And part of that is they just materials stick to them. And so for a long time, you know, I would just uh, say this is an example of inefficiency. And then there was a group out of uh, the MIT Media Lab that said, okay, well, let's actually do something about this. Um, so I'm gonna share, tell me if you cannot see this. There's gonna be a YouTube video that comes up. Yep. See that loading? Yeah, perfect. Yes. And you see my millions of tabs. Okay, so this is the traditional materials um, and the cohesive force between ketchup and a typical ketchup bottle, right? So you're actually using a lot of, uh, leaving a lot of product behind in the bottle. So what happens when you re-engineer the materials so there's less cohesive force and you can actually use all of the products? Think how much less waste that is across millions of bottles and how much less waste goes into a landfill. So that's another example of beyond repurchasing the pop bottle, um, but also making the um, pop bottle itself or the ketchup container better. All right, one sec. YouTube has decided to do something. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm just going to go back to full screen here somehow. There we go. Nope. I have now, give me one second. It is now exited out of the screen. We'll just reload it. No. Sorry about that. You can see the presentation again on the screen? Somehow. Yes. Perfect. One of these days I'll embed these better. All right, so that is just kind of an, in a, an introduction to the type of thinking and the new types of innovation mindsets that I want you to adapt as we go further into this course and our sessions together. So that was the introduction to what I hope to teach you. So now we're gonna introduce ourselves to each other. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Shauna Pandia. I wear a lot of different hats in addition to teaching this course. Um, I'm a physician, scientist, astronaut, candidate, explorer, aquanaut, speaker, skydiver, martial artist. Um, I wear a lot of entrepreneurial hats. Um, I develop immersive medical technologies with a company called Lexonic, which I'll include more case studies about later this and next lecture. I am the Director of Medical Research for Orbital Assembly Corporation. We will talk about that next session. Um, and I also get to test spacesuits in really fun environments. Um, I'm advisor to several companies, including Genesis and mm, Mission Space Food, um, both within the medical life sciences technology spheres. So that is my 30 second intro. I want to know all about you. This is the biggest class we've ever had. So we'll do a quick two liner that you know would be what you want other people to know about you. So I'll go down the list. Um, Kim, go ahead. Oh, he may be on mute. 
Oh, uh, am I? Oh, uh, well, it's gonna. I was. I was curious to hear Kim's uh, two liner, but uh, uh, Tian, yeah. you can go ahead. Oh, uh, I just. I was. I wasn't sure which order. Sure, Tian, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm a double major in bio and comp sci currently, and um, I just want to work within the medical technology space and innovations such as just VR use in medicine and all that. So. Very cool. Um, Alec, you're next on my list. Oh, shoot, uh, I'm a um, second year medical student at the U of A and I'm here kind of looking at kind of getting a better sense of what the future of medicine looks like and um, kind of where I might fit in that and kind of, it seems like just like a really cool course. So there you go. Awesome. Uh, I'd be curious if you want to type it in the chat, Alec, what you're interested in doing um, a for CARMS and beyond. Um, and we'll move on to the next person while you're typing that in. Selena, you're next on my list. Uh, hey, I'm actually a um, not a roommate, a classmate of Alex, so I'm also in second year of medicine. Uh, and yeah, I just kind of thought this course and the content was super cool. So something I I'm wanted biased, to learn. I, I, happen, I happen to agree. This is a very cool course. Uh, and Anne, I hope I'm saying your name right. You're next on my list. Um, yes, it's Anne. Um, I'm a third year neuroscience student at the, at the U of A, and I'm interested in seeing and hearing other people's perspective on the future of medicine. Awesome. Uh, and Selena, if you want to type what you are interested in as well, and that's fine, Alec, if you have no clue, second year is way too early. Uh, Nadia, you're next on my list. Hi, um, I'm Nadia, and I'm in my fourth year of a combined science education degree. And I'm in this course just to learn about the future of medicine, science, and everything in general. Very cool. Lauren? Hi, hey everyone. Um, my name's Lauren. I'm a first year med student at U of A. Um, and I also kickbox, so that's nice to see a fellow Excellent. kickbox. Great. That's awesome to hear. Alyssa, um, you are next on my list. Okay, so my name is Alyssa and I'm a first year master's student in pediatrics. Um, I hope to have a career in biotech one day. So I'm here to learn about the all the cool technologies coming out and how I can kind of fit into that and hopefully draw those into my own research. Wonderful. And if you guys have more that you want to offer beyond your two-liner, feel free to um, put it in the chat. So Young, you're next on my list. Hi, my name's So Young. I use they them pronouns. Um, I'm currently in my last semester of my undergrad uh, degree as a philosophy major and women's and gender studies minor. Um, I'm interested the, in this course because I think tech, uh, from an intersectional framework, technology is going to be one of the intersections. We already see that it produces oppression and privileges. Um, so I'm quite interested to see how technology goes to impact folks. And I also work on front lines with the homeless people. So I'm kind of, kind of quite in the middle of the marginalized groups and how technology comes to play when it comes to healthcare and medicine. Very cool. Anka, you're next. Hi, I'm Anka. I'm finishing up my last year of neuroscience at the U of A and I work in the startup space. So I'm super interested in emerging tech. Awesome. Uh, my <laughs> name has jumped around. Uh, Thomas the Nolan, if you haven't gone yet. Sure, I'll go. Yeah, I'm in my last year, my fourth year, my undergraduate degree majoring in political science, and I'm here because I love technology. Wonderful. You're all in the right place. Nolan? Uh, yeah, uh, I graduated uh, with a degree in physics from UBC, then worked uh, as a software engineer for a telehealth company for a few years, and now I'm a first year med student at U of A. Wow, what a cool career. Um, Charlie, then Kai, then Nori. Hi, I'm Charlie. I am also a first year medical student at the University of Alberta. And I really like technology, I'm a huge nerd about it. And I'm just really excited to hear about and discuss how far it can go. 
Austin, Kai. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kai. I've you know, worked for a number of years in the global health sphere, and uh, now I am a first year student uh, in medicine at U of A. Noreen? Hi, uh, my name is Noreen. I'm in my second year of my undergrad. Um, and I took this course because I feel like technology is going to be really important in bridging the fundamental gap between developing and um, developed countries. I am from a developing country within Egypt. And so um, this course I feel like would might um, provide some, me some, with some insight to help um, do something about that problem. Thank you. Perfect. Tian, have you gone yet? Yeah, sorry, no, you went first. My apologies. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Shanine, Shanine Vendarian. Hi, I'm Shanine. I'm a third year psych student and um, I'm really interested in the going into the psychiatric field. So I just wanna see how the future of medicine will look like, especially in psychiatry and yeah. Perfect. Uh, and then Darian. Hi, I'm Darian. I'm in my fourth year of my computing science degree. And I'm really interested in this intersection between arts, design, and technology. So I'm taking this course just to see uh, what the possibilities look like. Perfect. Wow, this is probably one of the most diverse groups ever and one of the largest groups. Um, so if this continues on, uh, we may not have the opportunity to um, talk one-on-one, -on -one, but we'll appreciate it while it lasts. Um, so we have two options. Uh, this is your course. I want you to get the most out of it. Traditionally, we leave a lot of time for questions and discussion in, in throughout. Um, in the virtual world, the lectures tend to go a little bit longer. So if you want me to just blast through my slides and do discussion at the end, I'm happy to do that. If you'd rather kind of pose your questions as they go, because you'll get more out of that, um, feel free to do that. Just kind of type in your chat your preference and I'll read as I plug along here. So getting back to the lecture, first question that I promised to answer today, what is innovation? So what do you view as examples of innovation? Like what is your definition? Feel free to unmute yourselves, type it in the chat. Um, I think it's inventing something new. When I think of innovation, that's what I think of. Okay, in inventing something new. Yeah. Anyone want to build on that idea? Um, I think of making something that, making something better, something making that exists along to it. Yeah, inventing something new, making something better. Any other comers? It doesn't have to be, I think, inventing. I think it also just can be identifying a new way of doing something, you know, just a new, a fresh perspective um, at something that exists already. Yeah, exactly. I see. I agree with that that comment. And Anka, I see you put in the chat. It's it's a novel way of doing something it, um, that that hasn't been done previously. So I want to take this next section and take you through examples of technology um, that have built upon previous ideas. And so um, probably dating myself a little bit here. Uh, someone, some of you may recognize this, but back in the day, um, you know, Windows ninety five before it was Windows X and Windows ten was. Um, Windows 95 that people lined up for at midnight to be able to get the latest copy of. Um, this is what it's evolved into today. Um, and even, you know, the, these things that we have in our hand, our external brains, our smartphones, we have more computing power in our hands than all of NASA had to send people to the moon in 1969. Um, this old clunky iPhone is a dinosaur today, 12 years after its inception. So, it was, um, you know, our, we, we're, the, the, at the time that the smartphone came out, it was a brand new innovation. And now um, we would say the iPhone X, we would say the, the Galaxy Note 10, the Galaxy, the S Note 20 um, are all innovations of what has come before. So it's simply building on the idea that came before it. Um, and two lectures from now, I believe, you're going to have idea, the opportunity to work together in your small groups to build upon the ideas that you, um, to, to create ideas and then build upon each other's ideas. Um, innovation can be completely novel, things we haven't seen 
uh, previously. So there are companies like Aeromobile and Terrafusia working on the concept of a flying car today. So Jetsons is no longer the realm of science fiction. We have hoverboards as well. We can borrow on ideas. How do we get to innovation? Bor by borrowing up from ideas from stories, fiction, Hollywood, science fiction. So this is the one and only Buzz Aldrin uh, working with Autodesk to test the world's first hoverboard. Um, I think it was based on uh, magnetic maglevs um, technology. Uh, this was 2016 or 2015, I believe. Other examples, drones. So I got my first drone camera. Let's see if I can pull it up for you this year, but drones have been around. Um, we can use drones for food delivery, for photography, for fun, for delivery. Um, for delivery where infrastructure doesn't exist. Um, there's startups working on drones for medical and medical aid and medication delivery. What about the complete inane? Innovation doesn't have to be useful, but what about smart furniture that comes to you? This was out of, I believe, one of the Stanford um, uh, design labs, uh, smart furniture that this is when you just need to put your feet up. 3D printing. So feel free to type into the chat applications of 3D printing, the official terms additive manufacturing, but uh, 3D Ooh, printing oh, is for, so for art. Um, so this is a really fun but gross application to 3D printing. So what someone did was they took the 3D projectile of a sneeze and then modeled the, the sneeze particulate and then took that model and inputted that into a 3D printer. And now you have a beautiful vase out of what was once flying um, mucosal matter. So <laughs> there's an application, 3D printing for food. So you can have your face and eat it too. Literally anything, yes, exactly. 3D printing for cells. Here's a BioBots um, additive a manufacturing device. 3D printing for space. So Made in Space is the first off-world 3D printing company. They're printing tools on the International Space Station. 3D printing for prosthetics. Here is an example of a turtle with pyramidalism, and they uh, lost it, it lost part of its shell, and now it has a new lease on life with its um, turtle prosthesis. Sorry, I should have warned you. There's graphic images in this talk. Um, it's also novel ways of doing doing um, techniques we may have been doing for a long time. So, for those of you well versed with medicine and surgery, um, you know when we're trying to preserve an amputated limb. Um, we, uh, we try to graft it, we try to preserve the limb, we try to graft it on back to the site if there's not been too much damage. What you see in front of you was a factory worker in China who lost his hands in an industrial accident. And while they waited for the arm stump to heal, they actually managed to preserve the hand and graft it onto the foot site um, for retransplantation later on. And this is the first of its time. Uh, this is also in 2015. It's looking at materials differently. So here's a new um, type of uh, uh, foam material used for oil spills. I'll let you watch the video for a second and tell you about it. So the absorbency of this new material is polyurethane um, that uh, is very, um, uh, uh, polyphilic or sorry, fat phyllic, um, lipophilic, and can soak up more up to all nearly a hundred times its weight in oil. So you can imagine the application for these environmental disasters um, and uh, oil spills that we often hear about in the news. So this is so. These are just simply examples of innovation. We can build on ideas. We can have completely novel ideas. We can think of new applications for old ideas. We can make things better. I'm currently working with a student high school team that aims to test polyurethane in space and see if the foam developed in microgravity has any different and more useful properties than we would see in 1G. So let's talk specifically about medicine and the opportunities and problem spaces there. First, I want to talk about frameworks. Um, it really helps to be able to operate within the constraints of the framework to help drive innovation. And so let's go through about five or six operating frameworks now. So let's talk about the World Health Definition, uh, World, World Health Organization's definition of health. It's when we talk about health, we think about simply not being sick. 
But the, the WHO model is more comprehensive that, than that. It's not simply the absence of disease, but it's a state, a state of complete physical, mental, social, and even spiritual well-being. Um, and so when we comp take that into, compre into consideration, um, how we think about health may evolve more than simply treating disease, for example, and focusing on the preventative. Here's the NIH in the US, um, the National Institute of Health um, models of, uh, of health. And so it's the 5P with the bonus 6P um, model of health. So predictive, personalized, precise, preventative, participatory point of care. And so these are all frameworks for making healthcare better. So what if we could, um, for example, through biomonitoring and looking at novel vital signs. Right now in medicine, we use heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, respiration rate. Um, uh, as models of how well or how sick a person is. But now we're looking at new measures um, that may someday be part of what we measure in the emergency room, like galvanic skill response, sorry, galvanic skin response, um, heart rate variability. Uh, we know from the literature that heart rate variability is an earlier predictor of, of stress um, and physiological stress and has been indicated, for example, in uh, liver failure and mortality, personalized. Um, why does one person uh, need low doses of warfarin as a blood thinner while someone might need massive doses to achieve a therapeutic effect? And how do we predict that? Um, that's where the precision comes in, being able to predict um, based on a person's genetic or phenotypic profile, what kind of dose they may need without needing to play around with it. It's the same with anything in medicine, whether it's antibiotic response or um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medication. Coming back to that WHO model, looking at um, keeping our patients well more often than not and keeping them from getting sick before they would ever present. Um, something I deal with a lot as a family physician um, is, uh, you know, getting my patients buy-in. You know, I can, I can offer all the solutions in the world that will help the patient, but if they don't believe that the blood pressure pill that I'm going to uh, give prescribed them will work, is easy to take and that they'll remember it, well then um, I'm just kind of spinning my wheels. And then point of care, and we'll talk about this more in the space medicine lecture. Um, what if we didn't have to go to the lab to figure out what um, you know my electrolytes were, um, what my hemoglobin A1C, the average measure of my blood sugar was? Um, what if I test that at home? The next model I want to talk to you about is the pillars. So the medical students in the audience will uh, be very familiar with this. Is what does it mean to be a physician in Canada? Um, we're often asked about the six pillars of the CanMed's competencies. Um, so what makes a medical expert? Scholar, um, being a scholar, a professional, communicator, collaborator, a leader, and a health advocate. And this is really where being aware of technologies and tools and how to stay on top of everything we're supposed to know as doctors becomes relevant. Because the literature and how we change, um, how we treat things and how, guideline, how often guidelines are changing is happening at an exponential pace. So often our, tie, our job isn't to know everything, but it's to know where to find answers and how to access that data and how to make sure that data is um, reputable. Um, this is the world, uh, the World Economic Forum publishes regular reports on emerging technologies. This is their 2019 view on emerging areas of innovation in healthcare. So smart care, kind of alluding to what we talked about before, um, care anywhere. Empowered care, that's that participatory care, having patients be owners of their own health. And then um, making uh, existing health homes smarter. I think this is the final, second, second to last framework I wanna to talk to you about. So when we talk about things we wanna make better, what is the framework that we're operating within? So the principles of the Canada Health Act. So um, the most often started, cited one is universality um, and accessibility. But how do we make sure that um, that we can bring our healthcare with us? Uh, there's we oftentimes as physicians run into hurdles if I'm trying to treat treat a patient from Quebec um, and they have an out of province healthcare number, um, and then making sure it's uh, publicly uh, administ uh, administered and uh, easily accessible. Finally, coming to the medical ethics of the um, a portion of our framework is. Knowing the principles of medicine, knowing that we want to respect our patient's autonomy, that we want to do no harm, that we want to work in the best interest of the patient, and we want to treat our patients equitably and fairly. Um, how can we, what, what areas are ripe for innovation, and how can we leverage technology or new ways of doing things to address um, existing problem spaces within medicine?
So these are all examples of frameworks. If you have ideas of your own, you've, your, of your own that you've come across in your various fields, feel free to put them in the chat. So now I want to talk about challenges, trends, and problem spaces in medicine. So obviously this one has had to be updated to reflect that we are living in the era of COVID-19 and uh, given the current trend, trend COVID-19 and 20 and 21. Um, we talked about the need for preventative care and you know, it's not just the, the critical illness and preventing patients from getting really sick, but there's also the economic argument and the burden um, that places on our healthcare system and how does monitoring feed into that. Um, something I deal with a lot, I cover a lot of rural ER. Um, how can, uh, there's a major, there's a vast difference between a rural ER in Northern Alberta versus a ter tertiary um, level ER that we would see at the U of A, for example. And how do we provide the standard of care um, at these sites in these areas that are resource limited? Um, I would say 98% of the sites I work at work with, um, maybe 99, have no access to a no CT scanner, for example. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the next ones in a couple of case studies, but how do we deal with the problem of antibiotic resistance? How can we repurpose old drugs for new purposes? How do we incorporate the patient context? What new technologies and trends can get us there? How do we make healthcare accessible for all? Um, for I know someone had mentioned they work very um, uh, closely with a vulnerable populations like the homeless, the indigenous, um, and I can tell you as a clinician, um, there's special challenges dealing with these vulnerable populations. Um, and then of course, uh, challenges um, with drug manufacturing, shelf life, side effect profiles, selectivity, and making drugs better. So let's talk about a few case studies now. So antibiotic resistance. This is a statement from the WHO that says antibiotics is happening everywhere in every corner of the world and can, has the potential to affect anyone, any age, any country, and is now a major threat to public health. From the antibiotic revolutions that have happened in the 1950s, bacteria have developed um, extreme amounts of resistance to the order of approximately 50% um, of that, due to approximately 50% of antibiotics being inappropriately prescribed. Um, and this means that we're having to resort to increasingly broad spectrum, expensive drugs that can also um, have nefarious side effects. So HIPTAS, for example, Piperacillin tazobactam was the machine gun drug when I was going through my training, and now that's been supple um, supplanted by things like the meropenem, the imipenem. Um, we, and, and we see that these aren't, these drugs aren't innocent. We see um, side effects profiles like developing um, C. difficile and Clostridium difficile, which at the best, at the best can cause a nasty case of di diarrhea and at worst case can um, uh, result to loss of the colon and, and hemicolectomy. Um, so then how do we do address this problem of uh, antibiotic resistance? So in 2015, the first breakthrough in decades had to do with a new drug class called Tazobactin. And the reason that this was so many decades um, beyond the initial um, drug revolution in the 50s was because we previously didn't have the technologies to, to culture this new organism from um, the soil organisms in which it was found. It was an intracellular component and we finally had better lab culture methods. Um, so moving on to it, other crises and opportunity spaces. So this is a very famous photo by now. Every one of us has seen COVID if on an hourly, if not daily basis. So how do we make innovation better? We're all you, or how do we, how do we make life in COVID better? How do we innovate? So we're all living in this era of social distancing, working from home, studying from home, wearing a mask, Anytime we go out, um, so how are people innovating in this in this day and age? So here's one example. Here is an example of a nut mask made out of recycled pop bottles. So there's those bottles again. Um, how are we doing education differently? This is a scene that's familiar to all of us now. Um, how do we bring the classroom back? I know a lot of you as medical students are missing out on the um, clinical skills that you might teach and you might get in person, the procedural skills. So this is one of the hats that I wear with Luxonic Technologies. I'm the VP of Immersive Development and we leverage virtual reality, augmented reality and 360 video to try to bring some of that physical workspace and learning space back. Um, 
And so here you can see, I do a lot of testing and work in extreme environments. So this was on an underwater mission, an aquanautics mission that we did in 2019. And one of our, our, our products is a um, virtual reality radiology suite. So instead of needing the $30,000 setup, all those monitors, all those high resolution monitors, we virtualize that workflow and put it into a headset. And so in this scenario, as the career physician, I'm entering um, that, that radio, uh, radiology reading room and I'm reviewing, reviewing a complex shoulder or scapular fracture with the head of radiology in Saskatoon, 4,000 kilometers away. So now imagine we could bring that a level of education and that immersion back a little bit in an era when we have lost some of that um, with COVID. So imagine now that even if you can't practice a um, IV on a patient or a dummy, you can practice that in VR. And so that's one of the ways that we're trying to um, turn a crisis or suboptimal situation into an opportunity. So I promised I would talk about drug repositioning. So here's some data out of Stanford that is using computer modeling to look at the 3D structure of pre-existing drugs and as well as, and looking at the, the at, at how they can match with 3D structures of receptors and seeing how they can repurpose um, uh, drugs previously used for, for other um, pathologies. So for example, they took um, cimetidine, which is a version of Zantac used for heartburn, and repurposing it, for example, to be uh, applicable in certain forms of lung cancer based on the 3D structure alone. Um, same thing with, with Topamax, commonly used for chronic pain, migraine, seizures. Um, again, maybe repurposing it for inflammatory conditions like uh, IBS. Uh, sorry, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Um, other case studies, personalization. Who here, just type it in the chat, who here's ever had to wear a cast? Who here's ever broken something? I'm sure there's a few of you. So you, you don't need me to tell you that they're itchy, they're horrible, they have pressure points, you have to um, change out your cast. Um, so what if you could have a cast that was easily, um, accessible that you could get in and out of that could avoid the pressure points um, that you could that lets you breathe and you wouldn't have that horrible cast funk after four to six weeks. And so this is an example out of a group in Russia in which they 3D printed a cast that based on the the anatomy and the the um, pressure points and divots in your in your hand and your arm that so was fitted to you. It's dishwasher safe so you can swap it out and wash it easily. And then they also did a study in which um, those plugins you see are ultrasonic high frequency waves that in their study was shown to improve bone healing time by 30, 33%. Coming down to genomics, here's an example out of Harvard Medical School, taking the entirety of the human genome and trying to make it digestible for the clinician. I, I don't have time to go through pages and pages of documentation in the hopes that it may help one of my patients um, with, their, with their pharmaceutical regime. So what this initiative has done has created one page summaries um, based on specific aspects of a patient's genome and then related relayed that into a um, clinically useful phenotype. So in this particular case, they look at um, how a particular genotype translates into a phenotype and then how that translates into a patient's drug response to warfarin, a blood thinner, for example. And then it gives you an idea of where to start with dosing. Um, this is now an obsolete uh, example, but this is an example of an application of AI. So Watson, um, this is kind of in the uh, over a half decade ago, um, using the applications of AI for diagnostics. Um, so Watson may have won Jeopardy, but the applications for medicine didn't pan out. But the, the areas of research for um, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, big data mining, um, and using, uh, using these technologies to look at trends, looking at large data sets, and then help us do medicine better. So for example, we'll talk about this more next class, um, but for exploration class missions, where we're talking about sending humans to the moon and beyond, um, we're concerned about not having that access to flight surgeons on Earth. Um, so doctors are fallible and we don't know everything. So what if we could have an AI that helps us with diagnostic decisions um, based on the literature, based on trends, based on best practices? We, I promised you would talk about patient context and lifestyle. This is, um, especially in your preclinical years, you know, this is something that's hammered home a lot. 
Um, this is an interesting study from 2015 that looked at the association between divorce and risk for MI or heart attacks. And what they found was that the patient context and lifestyle um, was a significant risk factor for um, a heart attack. Um, and it was worse with women. Uh, and the bad news was that um, it was it, this, this risk factor did not decline with remarriage. So, um, you know, for, for the news that was going around at the time, the joke was that marriage is deleterious to women's health. Um, this one is one of my favorites that I'll never, I'll probably never take this out no matter how much this ages, but this is an article that, uh, that appeared in the BBC a few years ago. It's not about using, just about using high-tech solutions, but also using the environment around us. So in this um, particular uh, study, they block sourced um, pathology uh, for breast cancer screening. And what they found was that when they, they trained pigeons to look for patterns of breast cancer detection, and they rewarded them with bird seed, and their um, accuracy as a single pigeon was as good as a pathologist. And when they flock sourced it, the accuracy of breast cancer detection increased to something like 98 or 99 percent. So these are all just examples, um, but you know, there's 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 um, the the domains across which we can innovate continues to to change um, uh, and evolve with every year that I teach this course and. Um, this list keeps getting longer and longer from additive manufacturing to big data to using um, geolocation to, to say that, you know, based on where you tend to be, where you tend to go in your day, how is that a determinant of your health? What apps can we use to make your health better? Um, so I know physicians who prescribe um, uh, apps like MyFitnessPal to patients for weight loss and calorie monitoring. Um, what trends um, can, can, help, can we expect on the horizon? Um, so we often hear that term faster, better, taller, faster, better, cheaper, smaller. So this is something that DARPA, the Defense and Research, uh, Advanced Research Project Agency the, um, that looks into crazy ideas has really taken to heart. So um, they've looked at things like nanobots for, for healing um, and mechanical respirocytes for um, breathing underwater for long duration. Um, so that's an example of nanomedicine at work. Um, we've already talked about AI um, in immersive medicine, like VR and AR. Um, but the world is changing, and it's kind of up to us to leverage it for, for good in medicine. So this is kind of um, not to say that th th this, this class is, is focused on innovation thinking, and into in a, especially in medicine. Um, but it's not just limited to medicine. Once you develop that innovation mindset, especially those of you who've worked in the startup world, uh, you know the end list of prob problems that we deal with is never ending. So when we talk about social problems, um, you know we we see the strife, we see chain migration. Um, there are more refugees now than there have been since the Second World War. Um, more people are con are considered enslaved at this time in 2021 than at any time in human history. Um, we talk about advances in exploration, how we sent humans to the moon. But we haven't been back in nearly 60 years. Um, there's a lot of exploration to be done here on Earth as well. We've mapped more of the moon's surface than we have of the, the, our oceans. We've only mapped 5% to date. Uh, I don't need to tell you that climate change is a massive issue. And then even social equity amongst genders and cultural backgrounds. So keep that in the forefront of your mind as we go through this lecture, because what we talk about in the last part of this lecture with respect to developing innovation mindset is not just for medicine and problems and challenge spaces in medicine. Okay, so that brings us to our last section or second to last section. So how do we get there? We talked about the what and the why. Let's talk about the how now. So let's, I want to break this section down into four aspects. I want to talk about the people, the mindset, the environment, and the experience when it comes to fostering innovation. For those of you who are interested, um, I have a couple of TED Talks I've included. So um, this is my 2010 TED Talk, and it's called Everything I Thought I Knew About Innovation Was Wrong. Um, so it's about some of my insights when I worked with my first startup in Silicon Valley about um, misconceptions that I had. Hopefully this won't open in a new tab. No, it will. Okay, there we go. Uh, so the next thing that we talked about was uh, that I want to talk about is people. So 
I think you saw how excited I was about the, the number of disciplines in this class. And that has been a traditional hallmark. We've seen computer sciences, we've seen masters in experimental surgery, we've seen medical students, we've even had a spine fellow previously. Um, so why does that interdisciplinarity matter? So it's the same argument that we see when we make the argument for having more um, genders, more ethnicities at the, at the table, because when we have more perspectives, we offer more viewpoints for problem solving. Um, and it's a way to build on, e build on each other's areas of expertise and then build those cross-disciplinary bridges to build on each other's ideas and come to a solution together. So the other part of that is developing that common language. I often like to say when I'm working in groups that we're here speaking English, but not speaking the same language. Um, so we also need to re remember to train, to, I need to remember to translate my medical jargon into easily understandable words for my patients and collaborators. And the engineers, for example, need to be able to um, translate their concerns um, into easily uh, understandable problems. This is something that I deal with on a daily basis when I'm working with the VR development team, for example, at Luxonic. So the bottom line is you don't need to master all skill sets, but you do need to be able to know where your limitations are and figure out who might help you. You don't need to be that brain surgeon and rocket scientist. You need to find good people. You need to find small agile teams and then empower each other to work. So the next thing that I wanna talk about is the mindset we need to get there. So I wanna talk about several um, types of mindsets that we can adopt to embrace that innovation mindset and also apply it. So the first thing is developing that idea of questioning everything. And I'm going to include some exercises at the very end of this lecture to um, help you develop that idea and help you apply that in your daily lives. And if you have time to apply it between now and the next few lectures that I'm teaching, I'd be really um, curious to hear what your experience was. So the first question I like to ask and that we've been asking throughout this lecture is how can this be better? We've asked this with something as simple as a um, as a soda bottle, but you can ask that with anything, with a you know, with the design and with uh, of and layout of a typical craft classroom, um, with traditional architecture, um, and then you can take it one step further and say, well, what skill set do I have to make this better? Um, so this is one of my favorite case studies because this is um, the Anya Polgarian. She was 18 at the time. She was volunteering in a hospital. She looked um, and she noticed you know, the size of uh, the traditional dialysis machine, the size of a refrigerator, um, it's on the order of magnitude of tens of tens of thousands of dollars. Um, but what if you live in a resource limited area or there's a disaster um, or you, um, a natural disaster, you can't get to the hospital or you're just not a, a traditional dialysis facility isn't accessible to you? Well, she redesigned a portable, um, uh, dialysis machine that was the size of a suitcase that they could be used in one's home and that is an order of magnitude cheaper. The next the final question that I like to encourage um, my my students and mentees to ask is what if and there's so many different ways you can take this what if I could make this better what if this wasn't like that um, so here's the other TED talk that may be of interest to you this is my 2019 talk at the International Space University um, and it's called Discovering Exploration. And it's about adapting, adopting that exploration mindset um, to, to explore, push the limits, and expand our horizons. So we'll skip past this. But um, the next case study I want to tell you about is uh, Semmelweis. So those of you who are in your preclinical years, I think you've been taught about this. But his, his crazy what if idea wasn't a high tech intervention, but it was simply saying, maybe we would have less maternal mortality in the peripartum period if we did something crazy, like wash our hands after we've been to the morgue. And he was actually ostracized for this. Um, he became an outcast and spent the last of his days um, in misery in an asylum. Um, and he says, when I look back upon the past, I can only dispel the sadness which falls upon me by gazing to that happy future when infection will be banished. And that conviction that such a time must inevitably sooner or later arrive will cheer, cheer my dying hour. So it was a, it was a uh, sad end for something that is very, very commonplace now, especially in the era of COVID, you know, hand hygiene, um, careful hand washing is one of the first principles you, you learn before going into your clinical rotations. Um, but as early as the late 19th century, um, or as recently as the late 19th century, it was a 
crazy novel idea. So here's the next um, principle of mindset that um, uh, I want you to adopt. And it's learning to develop that anticipatory mindset. Um, and specifically, I want you to think about what it means to adapt a growth and exponential growth mindset. And so let's go through a thought experiment right now. So imagine that you are on a treadmill and you decide to um, increase your rate of walking on this treadmill at a linear rate. So at an arithmetic sequence, in an arithmetic sweep fashion. So you go at one kilometer per hour, then two kilometers per hour, then three kilometers. And it's, it's, very, it's a very, very nice um, manageable pace. So let's switch over to the geometric um, uh, expansion now and an exponential progression now. So now say you're walking along at a snail's pace at one kilometer per hour. And then you're like, this is fine. I can handle this. You go up to two kilometers per hour, not a big deal, same as before. So you decide to up it to four kilometers per hour. You're going a little bit faster now. Suddenly you're up to eight, to eight kilometers then 16, then 32 kilometers. And the next thing you know, you've fallen off the treadmill and are flat against the rear wall. Um, and that's exactly what exponential thinking, um, adapting that exponential mindset is like. Um, it's learning to think about what the next disruptive force um, will be beyond what current trends suggest. Um, so here are some examples. So let's look at um, access to media and communication. Let's start off with the radio. How long did it take to reach 50 million people? For the traditional radio, 38 years. For Facebook, it took two years. Uh, this is a dated, but the last, uh, this was several Taylor Swift videos ago. It was 12 days. Uh, this is very dated because I think the last um, Taylor Swift video was less than 24 hours. Um, so this is, so Taylor Swift is now being her own disruptive force, uh, is your takeaway from that. So other examples of disruptive thinking um, that's exponential, but not necessarily numerical. So when we think of bookstores, we think of that traditional corner shop um, where we would buy um, a book. Um, and then came along Barnes & Noble, the big box type bookstore, which could offer all of your titles and selections without needing to wait for it. Um, so then Amazon took that one step further and said, well, what if we just had a warehouse where we could have all of the books um, and you could just simply order it without ever leaving your house? Um, well, then how do we disrupt that? Well, then Amazon became its own disruptive force and said, well, what if we could just order instantaneously with an ebook? Um, same thing with the, with the media and, um, sphere. So blockbuster video, some of you may be too young to remember, but once upon a time back in my day, on a Friday night, if we wanted to watch a movie, we had to go all the way to the video store, rent a VHS tape, and then bring it home with us. So Netflix said, well, what if we could bring media to you? And there was, you could simply um, get your DVDs in the mail and send them back. And then they said, well, what, how is technology changing? How is the internet changing? How are streaming services changing? And that um, has evolved into what has gotten many of us through the pandemic today is being able to stream on demand. So then the other way to think about um, innovation and adopting innovation is what would the world uh, be like if um, we didn't have the technologies we had. So this is a great story from um, uh, a few years ago. And basically the family opted to live like it was 1986 in which the mom and dad were the year in which the mom and dad were born. And the reason they decided to do that um, was because they noticed their children were becoming, their four-year-old and their two-year-old were becoming addicted to their, their tablets. And so they said, we've had enough of this. And for from then on for a year, they decided to say no Google Maps. We're gonna use a map if we wanna get anywhere. We won't look at any photos of our newborns, uh, our, our relatives' newborns, unless it's a printed photo. Um, we won't use anything beyond a fax machine, no email. Um, the most advanced gaming system they had was an Atari. Um, and so when you put yourself in these constraints uh, and you look at that evolution that's happened simply between 1986 and 2021, it's kind of easy to see that pattern of how quickly things have changed. All right, so in the time that's remaining to us, I wanna go through some thought, thought experiments as we get into this innovation and futuristic thinking. So um, 
the first question I want to ask you now, I want to turn it back to you, is I want examples of jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago. Go ahead and unmute yourselves or put the, put the answers in the chat. Instagram influencer, yes. And you know, and many of you may remember that when Facebook was first becoming a thing and we were having social media managers, people asked, you know, how long is this gonna last? This is just a fad. Well, clearly it isn't. There's entire industries dedicated to the algorithms that drive user engagement, um, as well as uh, uh, that time, how long you spend on a single ad, whether you swipe or not. Um, what are some other examples of jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago? Well, here's my list. All right, so app developer. Well, there was nothing to develop apps on. Um, so I should specify smartphone app developer. Um, large data set miners, uh, data miners, big data analysts. Um, this is actually um, a title like this. That's a millennial generational expert. And as we move on, it will be a Gen Z generational expert. We talked about the social media manager, uh, cloud computing service providers, search uh, SEO specialists, user experience and user design experts, Bitcoin miners, yes, YouTube content or posters. So this was a little bit sad um, for me personally, but for the first time two years ago, the number one thing that kids these days wanted to become was not an astronaut, but a YouTube influencer. Um, so I was a little bit sad to hear that, but it's just the way the world is evolving. Um, Uber and food app drivers, yeah. Absolutely. These are really great suggestions you're coming up with. Um, and then looking at uh, the corporate world as well as the environmental world, sustainability managers. So then the next question is, that I have for you is, what are some examples of jobs that will not exist in 10 years? And while you're thinking of that, um, Zumba Instructor has increased 400 fold since uh, 2008, between 2008 and 2013. All right, let's see what the chat has to say. Cashiers, forms of manual labor. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was alluding to on the next um, slide. So self-checkout, we're already seeing this um, in many locations. Um, uh, telemarketers are being uh, replaced with spam, bot, spam, spam bots. Um, freight and stock, we already saw this in the drone delivery slide. Uh, print media is now become obsolete. It's all digital media. Um, yeah, exactly. Newspaper deliveries. I know that's how a lot of us, myself included, got our first um, paychecks. Travel agents have been supplanted by websites like Travelocity, Expedia, Kayak. Um, we've talked about Uber and Lyft. Uh, traditional transcriptionists are being replaced by voice recognition. Hopefully librarians don't go away, but online search is also, um, uh, at least for now, supplementing them, if not supplanting a lot of our search needs. Um, so then what about these new, new positions that we talked about on the last slide? What's going to happen to the social media ma managers and the Instagram influencers? Um, so then my last question for you is, what, exam what is an example of jobs that will not exist in 10 years? Um, yeah, and I also see your, your comments on teachers. Lots of family doctor functions um, could be replaced with personalized health apps. And that's even happening now, not with technology, um, but with, um, with uh, primary care. So we're seeing a lot of our jobs um, going uh, and being spread out to nurse practitioners, for example, especially in areas that don't traditionally have doctors. Um, all right, so ideas, examples of jobs that will no longer exist in 10 years. So let's we'll see what the chat says. Small court judges. Are you thinking of an AI maybe, but like a maybe minority report style or what are you thinking there? Okay, all right. Um, so the chat says, oh, parking tickets. Okay, uh, waste data or jobs that will exist in 10 years. Sorry, I didn't phrase that right. So waste data managers. So um, I once attended a talk by Vince Cerf, father of the internet, and he said, how are we going to deal with bit rot? How are we going to open a PowerPoint today from today when we when we are in the year 3000 dealing with PowerPoint 3000? Um, healthcare navigators, as healthcare becomes increasingly sub and sub sub specialized, we still need those those um, 
big picture um, navigators who can help those of us who don't have that medical background um, deal with uh, the medical system and know everything that needs to go into a patient's health. So for example, when my, my uncle was dealing with Parkinsonism and then a broken hip and then urosepsis um, and pneumonia, you know, I knew what to ask because I was in the field, but I was the one who was having to translate for my um, family that, you know, each day we're hoping to do this, decrease infection, do this with mobility, advance his diet. And so, you know, having someone dedicated to help um, families navigate the, the medical system um, and uh, get more specific healthcare. Um, <laughs> yeah, it looks like geriatricians are gonna have solid job security. Um, seeing some comments about apps that exist already. Um, alternative currency bankers. So we talked about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, augmented reality architects. So literally people who will be uh, uh, building, you know, the holodeck or the matrix. 3D printing engineers, we already have that today. Privacy managers, especially, you know, we have kids who have no choice, uh, who have no say in whether and how public their lives are because from the moment they're born, their photos are on social media. Um, octogenarian and beyond centenarian service providers. Um, what about human augmentation and uh, enhancement? What if we can make ourselves better, should we? We're already kind of doing that in the realm of cosmetic surgery and physical appearances. But how many of you, if you had the ability to have a photographic memory, would take it? Um, maybe we'll have memory augmentation specialists. There was a um, article in the New, or New England Journal of Medicine about five years ago um, in which they accidentally gave a patient eidetic memory with some photographic memory with deep brain stimulation because they were a couple millimeters off from their targeted site and were hoping to target um, hyperalimentation and obesity. Um, extension revivalists. So Jurassic Park come to life. Um, and then second generation astronauts. So what I mean by that is right now spaces for researchers and engineers and pilots. What happens when we make space accessible and make it for the entrepreneurs, the athletes and the artists. So we're, as we get into the last 15 minutes of our class today, um, I wanna talk about the importance of environment and how that can help foster innovation. And so the first question is, we want to practice applying innovation um, and then facilitate that process for others. So let's talk about the type of environment that helped foster that. And so the physical engineering and design um, can help facilitate that. So this is an example of the layout at Pixar where it's very open um, and very uh, open space workplaces. Now I know in the past few years, maybe there's been some uh, uh, contradictory data that says maybe it helped, it, uh, takes productivity down a bit. But the case story from Pixar is that to get to the bathroom, um, or to, sorry, to get to, get to, for example, the mail room, to get to critical aspects of the, that you would need to access on a daily basis, you need to cross the center of the campus. And their hope is by doing that, you'll, you'll interact with departments, um, engineers, animators that you normally wouldn't. Um, so that's one example of environmental workspace engineering. Here's an example of the layout of Google. Similar, similarly, no cubicles, very open workspace. So the interesting thing is now that um, I've been teaching this course for a few years, we get to see the also the dark side of, uh, of these innovations. And we get to talk about the land of unintended consequences with um, altered productivity. Um, here we go. So what else can we use to help foster that innovation? Um, well, we're also living in the age of platforms to help empower our ambitions. So we have new pl platforms to design on, to build on, to develop apps on. We have things like Kickstarter and CrowdSpring to fund our ambitions. We can teach ourselves about anything through MOOCs, massive online and open courses like Coursera, Udacity, um, MITx, and more. And we can be mini programmers and developers um, on things like Raspberry Pi and the Arduino. Um, and even the Makey Makey, which if we have time, I'll take you through a video of what that is. Um, and we can broadcast ourselves through platforms like YouTube, SoundCloud, and more. We're more connected than ever with uh, social media, with WhatsApp, with Discord. Um, and we are also finding ways to augment our world through augmented reality, virtual reality, and more. So the final thing I wanna talk about is the experience. How, um, what kind of personality type um, and what kind of disciplines and personalities um, tend to embrace innovation? 
So this is the data from the Harvard Business Review that looked at top five um, business leaders. They looked at Michael Dell, um, Pierre Omidyar, Scott Cook, and Michael um, Lazaridis. And basically they looked at five key traits compared to the average population. And they labeled these leaders innovators versus non-innovators. And they were all shown to have higher, um, higher scores with respect to associating, questioning, observing, experimenting, and networking. And so let's take all of those in turn. So associating, that's kind of where this interdisciplinarity takes place, is making connections between things that you wouldn't have thought um, to have association. So what is a pop bottle? It's not just a container. What if it could be used as um, you know, a planter or a feeder? Questioning, we talked about adapting that what if mindset, how can this be better and how do I make it better? Observing, looking around the world for things to be made better and we'll come to your, your optional homework assignment a little bit later experimenting you know <laughs> one of the one of the best ways to to figure out how to make something better is to try to break it um and then networking but that, that brings us back to that interdisciplinarity so the other thing is never ever doubt your own experience your set of own life experiences because they're unique to you and they can offer you unique perspectives so here's two case studies of individuals at opposite ends of the spectrum who are innovating and um, designing so this is a 91-year-old lady um, named Barbara, Barbara Knickerbocker Besking, who is employed with IDEA, one of the premier design firms in the world. And they took her experience living, living, um, being elderly and living in an old folks home um, to, to identify problem spaces. So for example, um, she herself and her contemporaries were noticing with their arthritis on and their knobbly hands, they couldn't quite open a pill bottle easily. So one of the challenges they embarked upon was how do we make more user-friendly um, pill bottles to open for this demographic? On the other end of the spectrum is a, a friend of mine. This is Aryan Mishra um, with the astronaut Sunny Williams. And when he was 14, he um, was just simply interested in exploration and discovery and discovered an asteroid um, simply by exploring the night sky. So, the bottom line when it comes to that experience is how do we develop it? it is by questioning, observing, experimenting, and trying to break things. So here are four principles. This is, the, this is not the end all be all when it comes to how to foster innovation, but this is a roadmap that you may take, you may choose to take given all of your interests in technology, innovation, um, doing things differently and doing things better. So finding the right people, finding the cross-disciplinary um, intersections, adapting that growth mindset, finding the environments that will let you innovate, and then also applying those questions. So maybe you're not uh, aiming to be that kid who um, cures cancer before breakfast in a, in a patient data set, but there's lots of ways in which we can innovate and there's lots of opportunities. Um, and one of the best questions to ask is, what is the future going to look like? And what is the future that we want um, and how do we get there? How incredible can the world and how different will the world be 10 years, 15 years, 50 years down the road? Um, you know, how can we uh, adapt technologies today to make our world um, uh, of tomorrow? What kind of data can we get by creating an augmented reality overlay of, our, of uh, the world around us? Um, what kind of imaging technologies will we have in the future? Um, what kind of environments will we explore um, beyond Earth? And what kind of technologies will we see in the future? Not just flying cars, but maybe autonomous cars. And that's already um, in, in uh, development and in um, application today. So finally, you know, we are living in a very different time than we were a year and a half ago. But also it's an opportunity to ask how we can do things better because this is what we as humans do best. We see crises and we also see them as challenges to be overcome. And we see them as ways to do things better, better whether it's education um, and adapting immersive technologies, whether it's doing masks um, differently and repurposing materials, um, whether it's um, you know doing something unprecedented in human history, like developing large scale vaccines for deployment in under a year. Um, what I'm trying to say is that op challenges are also opportunities for innovation and doing things better. And there are a lot of opportunities out there. So here's your optional homework for next time. 
Um, here are uh, some ideas I have for you. So pick your own Terminator far out scenario and describe what that is and what technologies might get you there. How might you um, augment the human brain? How might you um, uh, augment uh, human interconnectedness? Um, maybe there's a COVID specific scenario you wanna develop. Um, pick, a se pick a sector, especially one that you're passionate about, whether it's the uh, startup world, entrepreneurship, healthcare education space, um, and develop a future scenario for it. And we're actually going to spend some time, two classes from now, doing the, all this in workshop. Um, here's a really simple one you can do if you want to start applying that mindset that we talked about developing is take a notepad and a pen as you go about your daily life. Um, this was written for campus back when we still had that luxury. But even if you wander about your own home, is what are the problems and the inefficiencies you see and how can they be made better? Um, pick a technology that you wanna know more about, whether it's uh, immersive tech or whether it's, um, uh, you know, AI based um, and, and, you know, just do a deep dive on it. And so don't forget those key questions about how can this be better? How can I make this better? And what if? And don't be afraid to talk to each other. That's why you're here. You're in one of the biggest classes ever that I've seen, which is awesome. So you have a lot of resources. So um, we have some time for discussion. So in the last um, couple of minutes, 10 minutes here, within your own field, what are three big challenges you see to overcome? Uh, in addition to cryptocurrencies, what are emerging forms of currency? What are some of the great, greatest challenges that you anticipate that we have to face as a society and species? What are some of the coolest and craziest things that we have yet to achieve? Like, um, I don't know, telepathy, telekinesis. Um, what are emerging technologies we haven't yet talked about this class and how might they be applied to medicine? Um, and then what are trends in medicine that will help versus hinder progress? So that's it from me. Um, next time we will talk about space medicine, um, challenge uh, designs and opportunities and constraints for the space flight environment, as well as emerging technologies for human space flight. Um, I will turn it over to you for discussion and here is how you can contact me um, by email or on social media. So thank you for your attention. Thanks. Um, and yeah, if you have questions, unmute yourselves, uh, put it in the chat um, or feel free to talk to me um, post session. Excellent use of the applause emojis. That's amazing. Hey, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could give some insight into what the VR medicine innovation space looks like currently. I'm glad you asked. Give me one sec. Uh, so here is um, my VR headset. This is an Oculus. So I'll talk. I'll tell you specifically about what we're doing in the um, uh, immersive space. And I also have my other piece of technology that I like. Good thing that I'm not a clean person, <laughs> eating strewn about me. Um, this is my 360 Samsung gear. So um, in the VR space, what I'm working on, what we do with Luxonic Technologies is we make um, 360 video for MedEd. We do virtual reality for um, education and procedural training. And then we're also working on augmented reality for procedural guidance. So my origin story um, with this company is um, I first tested that technology in the underwater mission that you saw a bit earlier this lecture. Um, and then uh, Luxonic got a contract with the Canadian Space Agency to develop this a specific training module for um, space missions to the moon, Mars and beyond. And so kind of knowing my interests, um, that's how I came aboard this company. Um, but obviously, as you can all imagine, um, there's applications for Earth. So what we do for Earth, for example, is um, with the 360 video, um, if you have your headset or even on your phone, you can um, experience a clinical teaching scenario. Um, for example, like the hand exam, IUD insertion, um, approach to a patient with pneumonia as if you were in that scenario. Um, in the VR space, you can practice those um, uh, hands-on procedures um, without needing to be in a physical space. So IV insertion, central line intubation and more. Um, and then the just-in-time guidance augmented reality. So imagine you're an astronaut um, on a, uh, you know, on Mars and you don't have the access of uh, the luxury of being able to access um, mission support on Earth, but you need to run CPR and maybe it's the crew doctor you need to run CPR on. What if you had just-in-time guidance for that? 
So that's an example of what I'm working on. But the VR space is very, um, very full of examples. So for example, for surgical training, um, surgical planning, um, making 3D models um, uh, that are specific to the patient that you want to operate on. Um, so the VRAR Health Association, or sorry, the VRAR Association is a global association um, looking at immersive technology. And then if you, um, for example, look up VRAR Health, um, there's dedicated um, modules. Um, there's people working on anatomy. There's people working on physiology, um, education, surgical training. There's, there's a lot of potential. So um, that's just a, a little little surface skim of what, what healthcare and uh, immersive technologies hold. Uh, could you uh, unshare? Oh, sure. Yeah, let me do that. There yeah. we go. Yay. Any other questions? Hi, uh, I had a question, although it's not exactly like, I don't think it contributes too much to like a discussion of any sort, but um, I, I think this is just like somewhat of a personal question. Um, I th you and I are sort of united in the uh, sense that we are sort of entrepreneurs and sort of always seeking innovation. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I realize that I'm just like a random undergraduate. I'm not even at, <laughs> I don't even study at the U of A actually, um, but- hey, You're not random, you're part of this class. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, thanks. Um, but um, so I, I, I'm currently an undergraduate at McGill actually, and um, this year I'm working on, or I'm taking a lead on this project, uh, trying to um, combat the effects of the vaccine cold chain. Um, this project actually started a couple of years ago before we knew about COVID. So it actually seems a lot more relevant nowadays and now with the whole pandemic, but, um, you know, because of your experience inside this world of uh, sort of innovation, I'm sure you've probably run into the trouble before of uh, finding people that sort of share the vision, sort of are willing or actually have the means and the capital to help you out to sort of complete it. Um, I mean, most of these research projects are sort of government funded, but, um, or, I mean, if you uh, tend to go into the startup route, you sort of uh, go around to VCs and please them and they give you a bunch of money. But I um, was wondering, sort of, we are currently trying to look for benefactors that will sort of share this vision and want to sort of help us with this vaccine cold chain solution. I haven't actually told you like exactly what we're building for it, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it, it has a potential to be quite disruptive in the field and actually will most likely improve um, not only just the way we transport vaccines and the like vaccine cold chain, but also our pandemic readiness as well, which I, I, we probably Fair sort enough. of need to prepare for. But I, I was wondering if you knew anything about uh, sort of potentially getting uh, this sort of uh, support and you need yeah. for ideas. Or um, I wonder yeah, I think maybe I've cut out the slides for, for length, um, but, oh no, maybe I have them at the end of our workshop lecture, but yeah, those are those are three three quick themes that I picked up on are, you know, I think universal to all startups. Um, and so the first thing is you can have the perfect solution, but how you do that ground truthing, right? And we saw this a lot with the um, savior complex that the first world has for the third world and developing countries, like, hey, we're going to make everything better. And then, for example, with medical missions, we go in, we help. Um, those countries, but we don't give them the capacity building to help themselves, right? And this is true of whether we're doing medical missions uh, or whether, um, you know, we're, we're creating technology to save the world. And that's where that ground truthing comes up, come, becomes critical, is involving the people that you want to help from the start. Um, so maybe, you know, for example, with, with vaccine transportation, like who's going to be transporting the vaccine and what are their potential, um, uh, you know, reluctant uh, what might be the potential reluctance to adopt um, this novel transportation method. Um, so for example, with, with, with Luxonic, whenever we're scoping out a new module, we sit down with our shareholder or with our stakeholders and we do a scoping session. So they tell us exactly what they want. 
So that's the first thing is um, making sure you're developing um, for the people you want to develop for in a way that meets their needs. Um, because you could have this theoretically perfect solution, but if it's not what your user wants, even if it's, if it's perfect, it's imperfect for them. The second thing is finding funding. So you've hit it on the nail in that um, uh, it can be hard. Um, so, and there's multiple sources. And so um, granting is part of it. Um, but then playing with the VC game is, is you have to be prepared to um, you know, shake a lot of hands, um, but also um, and kiss a lot of frogs um, until you find that, that VC was the right fit for you. Um, you also have to have, um, and this is more lessons from space in the aviation world, you need to have contingencies for plans B, C, D, and E if you're not meeting your funding goal. Um, and then the, the non-official um, lesson I've learned is that you can have the perfect pitch deck, but again, it comes down to um, people. And so a warm introduction with someone who knows your background, knows your team and trusts you um, is going to get you a lot further with funding um, than a perfect pitch deck. Uh, and then finally, um, support groups. Um, so I'll, I'll have all these, you'll see all of these resources, uh, two lectures from now, but uh, local groups like Startup Edmonton, Startup Calgary. Um, there's, I'm sure now there's a lot of um, uh, support on U of A campus. There's Alberta Innovate. Um, there's incubators, accelerators. So you have to look at one that kind of fits the cultural fit, the philosophical fit, as well as the sector, the industrial technol technological fit that you're looking for. Um, so hopefully that's kind of applicable for, for you, Jesse, and for anyone who in the class who's looking um, and working in the startup space. Well, uh, I think the main problem that uh, I'm having currently is sort of actually being able to, it, it sort of seems like, I, I know I'll, um, mathematicians might tell you, uh, we only have like seven degrees of people from like me connecting to everybody else in the world, right? Like, so uh, if I, <laughs> theoretically, if I talk to the right people, I could probably get into the inbox of uh, Bill Gates um, within like seven emails to uh, people. But um, I, I think the problem with the startups is, and especially if it's like created by a bunch of university students, um, it's sort of getting uh, hard getting that one foot through the door in the first place. Like our idea is really like in my opinion it's really good um it's um essentially we've created a way to basically produce a vaccine on site so instead of actually transporting the protein or the antibodies over in like a glass vial right uh to maybe like a factory in china to a rural village in kenya um, we transport the sure. building blocks so Jesse, for a vaccine Jesse, first. Um, yeah, so I think this is going to be a bit more of an involved question. So um, I do want to respect um, oh, the, yeah. sorry, sorry. everyone's time. Not at all. I'm happy. You have my email address. So what I would invite you to do is follow up with me um, in an email. Um, and then um, if there's any other burning questions that are quick, I can answer them now. And then um, if there's any questions that will um be a little bit more involved feel free to email me and then we okay. will talk space medicine for all of you on thursday and then put you guys to work uh the tuesday following sorry sorry to cut you off but i do think this merits more of an in-depth discussion yeah of course i i totally understand thank you for answering <laughs> uh, yeah, what no you worries. any other burning pressing questions Perfect. Thank you all for attending. Um, Kim, thank you for making me part of the biggest class yet. Um, sure. Yeah, what I'll do in future classes is if we hit criti keep hitting critical mass is maybe I'll just um, do a Google form and get to know everyone's background ahead of time. Okay, great. So we'll see you on Thursday. Bye. Okay, take care. Yeah. <clears throat>